Joint Finance Committee meeting of the Town Council and the School Board. Today is Thursday, March 23rd. Um, and we are all present other than Sean Baybine, who will be joining us later, and um, Chris Gazza, who is up in Augusta testifying on the Gorn Connector. And possibly joins us. And possibly joins us. So we will start with old business, which comes back to the Budget Forum. We've done a survey online um, through the Town website, and I think. Larissa is going to help us with those results and what we found out. Yeah, well, the answer is right. <laughs> of course I do. Nothing like a good survey. So we had 180 responses, which is really? fantastic. Wow, that's great. 22.8% um, of the respondents had actually attended a budget, for budget forum in the past. Also fantastic. Um, I set up the survey through Google Forms. So when you clicked um, yes, you had attended either in 15 or 16. You were brought to the third question, which is um, what changes could we make to improve the budget form? If you clicked no, you were brought to the second question, which asked you if you did not attend, please tell us why. And then everyone, after either answering question two or three, were directed to the fourth question of if the budget format were changed, which of the following changes would you prefer to see? Helping us to kind of tease out some data. So what we found. I think the most telling pieces, in my opinion, is that um, for the reasons that people didn't attend, 46% were because they didn't know what was happening. Wow, that's amazing. That's amazing. So that's that really, amazing. really, that says to us that of the um, 139 respondents that didn't attend, 46% of those just simply didn't know what happened. And these are people that know that we exist because they answered the survey, which means they either follow us on Facebook or they go to our website. Um, so we're missing a group of people that may be willing to be involved. Yeah. Um, the second most common one was that they were unavailable for those dates. And then um, the third highest one, which I was interested to see, but it was only 11 respondents, but if we think of it as a sample of the community, um, they couldn't secure childcare. And we talked about that a little bit, that when you have a time of day that we currently have for the budget format, you may be isolating people because either they don't drive it in the dark, or they don't have the evenings open because they can't secure childcare. Um, in the community that I come from, whenever we have a budget type pro um, thing to do with the school, our PTA actually finds usually teenage volunteers to offer childcare on site. Really? And so that might be a way to solve that problem or encourage more people to attend. And I know the Key Club, um, uh, the Key Club is always looking for um, volunteer opportunity service hours. So that may be something. That and you know, having an adult in the room would be a great choice too. But if you're mostly being staffed by 16 to 18 year olds, that's great free labor and a, and a good way to go. So, um, yeah, nobody said that they couldn't get there because of lack of transportation. So that was nice. Um, so anyway, so those were reasons why people didn't come. The biggest one, of course, takeaway: we just need to do a better job of promoting that the event is happening and the benefits maybe of going. As far as um, asking people that did attend, so we had a total of 41 respondents who did attend a budget form in the past. What could we do to make it better? 56% um, of them said nothing. We like it just the way it is, please leave it alone. Um, coming in next was the format of the budget forum, and then just a couple of responses for the other um, choices. And then everybody was asked, all 180 people were asked, if we did change the format, what would you like to see? And the most popular by far was allowing questions from the floor. Um, and the followed from that would be roundtable question and answer sessions with elected officials and senior staff. Um, what, is, what, did that, what do you think that meant for that roundtable? Sort of like the community dialogue type thing? Maybe. Like, I guess I, when I wrote the question, yeah. what I had envisioned is instead of a panel of people, that the people, that the, instead of being a forum with a panel and people, you would instead be a forum with multiple stations where you would have a, you know, a school board member, a finance committee member, and a senior staff member, and people could be sitting and having more intimate conversations back and forth. So it would actually be a conversation as opposed to a providing of information. Um, but I don't know if that's how the people that answered it interpreted it. That was, that was, that was, that was, that was my question. They had like check boxes mm -hmm. there to choose from? Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and then 29% did want to see a more elaborate overview of the budget, uh, 29 people rather, 16.8%, a more elaborate overview of the budget. So those are our top winners as far as things that people would like to see changed. Um, our kind of thought that maybe two or three smaller events might be popular, it was 10% of the people were like, oh, sure, let's do that. 
And I'm not sure that um, 18 people saying, let's give that a shot, is worth scrambling to make that happen. Mm -hmm. That seems like a pretty small percentage of, of people. Mm -hmm. So that's the data we've received. Um, special thanks to our IT um, person, Sean Bushway, for uh, creating the pop-up on our website so that anybody that went to our website in the last couple weeks was yeah, directed. Cool. Yep. That's cool. Yes, and thank you for putting this all together. I think this is good information for us because I think it helps give us direction to the Absolutely. conversation that yeah. we've been sort of having but not knowing and trying to guess how we can make it better or um, improve it. So um, I think the obvious thing for me is communications and how do we figure out how to reach more people. It seems astounding to me that it's almost 46% of the people didn't come because they just didn't know it was happening. So well, it was in the paper, it was on public access. Was it in the leader? It was, was it in the leader? Yes, there were multiple different things that were out there. So I don't know, it was on Facebook, you know, what other ways are well, this there? This is something that I'm currently scratching my head at as well because the feedback from the community dialogue was to advertise it better and we even went a little step further, we emailed out like a postcard to every house. Um, right, so that was mailed and it was on social media and so I think that um, maybe those people didn't access it in so those ways that they feel like they didn't know about it. I mean that's the only, a couple of thoughts that just come to my mind as, as we're sort of going through is um, doing an article in the leader on what the budget form is, what the history of what we've done and how we sort of got to there. Um, and I don't know if that might be through Mike Furlow's um, space. I don't know, we always sort of go to that. Um, but then the other ways that I feel like um, people might see it on a more regular basis is that leader has that calendar, the calendar of events that happen every week. <coughs> yeah. If we put that in now, yeah. to know and it could sort of be in there every week on what's coming up, so it stays in there for the next three or four weeks, or five weeks, yeah. whatever. And then what about the community calendar um, online? I don't know. Again, I don't know how many people are looking at that. I think it's a great resource, and I don't go to it nearly as much as I should, but I just think we need to Is that saturate. the same as the Chambers calendar? Yes. Yeah, yes. The one that's right here on the front. We did have it posted on our website, but again, that's not an outreach thing. That's a you need to be happening to look at our website to see, oh, we're coming to the budget form. Well, and I think we do that. I don't think but, we eliminate any of the other things we right. did. But from your listening sessions, what we learned at our last meeting was there are, there's a huge chunk of people that aren't on They're Facebook going or to aren't on the computer yeah. to figure out a what flyer to do. at the library, a flyer, um, and I'm trying to think of what they call it. The Did they do any Hannaford, little posters? When you, when you leave Hannaford, the if you go out the, the one door, door, you know, I don't know if it's what it is, kids can yeah, or whatever. Or <coughs> yeah, Starbucks. But the, and, and, Starbucks and, and, has that one. There's also only so much we can do and how many places we can do it. Yeah. Do we do anything on the town's TV? That's what I was just going to ask, because we started putting little slides, slides up that maybe at least did we do that last year? I don't remember. That was mentioned a couple times in our listening session last night. People do seem to use that, especially I think some of the seniors use that as a as a way to get information. So oh, the community access. Yeah. Channel. Yeah. A little, little scroll. We can also put it into the town's newsletter in April first edition and April fifteenth, depending on when the the forum takes place. Or put notices, and maybe we do out here in the main hall, or you know, in the clerks. And Office. So the town newsletter goes out how often? Twice a month, first and fifteenth. Okay. Um, and also, could, Julie, where budgets are kind of a big deal right now in, in the Portland Press Herald, for instance, they've been doing a lot of stories about the Portland city budget and so forth. I wonder if you could actually, if we could connect with a couple of reporters and instead of having it in the in the leaders kind of Scarborough section, what if it were actually to be a story on its own? Like this is ways that towns are working to. Get the budget message out. Could sure. we have? Because we get to above the fold. Yeah, mm -hmm. we just yeah. were. Right. Yeah. Could we do it again with kind of a focus on messaging? Yeah. Do you, do our guests, do you guys have any insights? 
I think it's ironic that the people found the survey online, but they, but they didn't know about the meeting last year. And everyone gets the leader, and it was, you know, commented on and, and, and the leader for several weeks. So, scratch my head. It's hard, and I think I think with anything, it's multiple venues of getting avenues of getting the word out. But I think the library might be a good idea. I've used that. I've worked in there, and a lot of People seeing it to me wander in and out. Bob the board right there. Yeah. And the mainly the sign, the electronic sign by mainly wraps. That's so hard. I think that was. And the electric sign outside yeah. of Wentworth. Yeah. We have the library <coughs> one for sure, and the public work, uh, public safety one. Yeah. And I think Mark yeah. always puts yeah. all yeah. things yeah. up there yeah. for yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 I mean, if there's a phone, if there's yeah. a, all those things. So yeah. they're nice enough to do that for us typically. The community dialogue was up on all of those electronic right. signs. I felt yeah. like I was seeing it everywhere. But of course, oh, yeah. I was also involved in it, so <laughs> you don't just no, say it. No, it. it was well. The community yeah. dialogue was there. I, I saw it in multiple places. Yeah. Stuff. stuff you never know what it is. I mean, it could yeah, be no. anything. Maybe it was just that particular night that everybody had something going on. Or, you know, I mean, it's hard to pick. You know, you need one of those air jets that just <laughs> <laughs> fly over all our now. Are <laughs> the signs across this, the, the whole street that says vote here now, like instead of like a form? Yeah. 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 But that well, costs money. Yeah. You know. Dancing bears on the street corner? Yeah. Well, that's free. So I think um, what's a next step for this is for Peter and I and Carrie and Kate yep. to hash out a plan um, how to communicate it. Yeah, and I think you know we use all of the things we did last year and maybe some of these new ones and we can create a slide and um, get that to you or the sooner we can get the date out to people in calendar or on the slide on the TV, the better, because then that can just run forever until it's over. Um, does that sound like a plan? Yeah. Um, I was also just thinking, too, of the different community groups that we have, maybe asking them to put it on their agenda. So whether it's like Rotary or Kiwanis or, um, you know, like the Scarborough School Supporters or SEF, just kind of finding a point person from each of those groups and saying, can you please communicate this with your constituents? Is that something that could be said at like the finance, uh, council meetings or school board meetings and, and maybe you already do? Yeah, I think we, we do that. Do. Yeah. Yeah. The, we yeah. do that. I'm not so sure that they're more attended by some of the individuals that are sitting at the table. <laughs> the other thing was power school. I thought um, they have like school announcements Power announcer. Power announcer. Yeah. I think yeah. we must have done something because I remember we invited staff because a lot of staff live in Scarborough. We could look back and see what we had done, but I always struggle with when to use that because it's I know, really, really want it to be for emergencies, but um, I think at least through an email communication. What about every one of the schools does a newsletter maybe every week? Well, I know at least the middle school does, but different ones send out different things, but just to put it into that so that it's not another something that somebody's getting, but it's included and maybe put some, you know, asterisks or something by it or, you know, a bold type or something up at the top that says, you know, please join us at the join, or, you know, budget, budget form. So. And then what are um, our thoughts on the format? And what changes did we make to improve the budget forum? So those are only the people that had attended in the past. Right. And so 56% of them said nothing. You know, I think, I loved your idea earlier, and it kind of, what we heard, but there, the next largest block wanted some type of breakout tables. And that kind of went to, we had talked about maybe restructuring the format so we had announced hours for certain topics. Maybe we do the normal sort of forum, that's what most people want, but then have some of those breakout tables arranged by subject matter or something, so it kind of, you know, kind of models the two things. I don't know what people think about that. Or then are you talking about lengthening, lengthening, sorry, I can't spit it out today, 
maybe not cutting length, it. Maybe not lengthening it, but just kind of reconstructing the time a little bit. And kind of we do give a, uh, have a different venue this year, which lends itself to the breakout mm -hmm. sessions. We were talking about community dialogue earlier, and what we've ended up having to book by necessity is the one with CAF and the stage there. So we could set it up as audience and stage, but we could also set it up as round table, uh, more like the community dialogue. I was thinking something similar because that would really address the allowed questions from the floor and also the round table discussions if we let people do it almost the same way where you write your question mm -hmm. and then it gets yeah. assigned to a table and just one of us maybe would be responsible for leading the dialogue. I don't think we could expect a community member to necessarily lead that dialogue the way we do with community dialogue, but we could sort of adapt that yeah. process. I would. And you almost wish that when somebody answers that question about the allowed questions from the floor, that they might not have been there because questions are allowed from the floor. That's why those... Well, you have the cards and yeah. you hand them here. I think it might, might have been... Well, come to the microphone I'm, and ask. I'm guessing <laughs> that maybe what they're thinking of is that the follow-up isn't really available because you ask your question and then there's a response and then we move to the next thing. So that dialogue that would be available at the table where you could go back and forth might be a nice addition to that. I wonder, but I think it was more like in the interest of time where it was like, okay, we ask you a question, you get the answer, but there's not really a chance to go back and forth a lot about it. Right. I wonder if we would want to do a little bit of, um, well, it doesn't even need to be ahead of time, but instead of the community dialogue where there's so many questions and very, very specific mm -hmm. targeted interests, maybe we... Um, assume that there's going to be kind of three or four like broader categories and things, and that yes. way more of a smattering of people like from school board and town council and different um, employees could be available at each of those tables rather yeah. than being spread too thin. Yeah, that's great. Idea. So put yeah, like two that. tables together because each one. Gets well, just sort of having a group like a a broader subject rather than right. I come up with a very specific question and then there's only it could probably three fall people into a category. It would fall into a category. Yeah, you could make up half a dozen topics that you would want to cover. Well, and we could do that based on past questions. That's right. We've right. got a lot of issues in the past. I have two years worth of data of what people were interested in. The and there are some kind of things. <coughs> and it may be that if we do it the same way too, where we have questions come in early, if there's some real themes from those questions, mm -hmm. organize around those so other people can <coughs> round out some of the questions. <coughs> and, uh, I like that model, having some discussion at the table, have them come up with one or two questions they want to ask out. Yeah. And then, so. But you also uh, have people saying they'd like a more elaborate, <coughs> elaborate overview of the budget, yeah. which goes to the sort of intro that we did. I, I think we kept most of those people. It was because everybody, everybody got that question. I was kind of wondering if some of those people weren't ones who attended, and I mean, some of them maybe were, but well, I think we deliberately kept it short because we were assuming that folks had listened to the budget presentation yeah. on the night before, and there have actually been two of them because right. not night before, but town council. There's the, the town board. council meeting with the original presentation, and there's a school board meeting with another sort of follow-up presentation about that part of the budget. So maybe we're assuming too much. Maybe the people who are coming to this, it's their first right. relationship with the budget. I think that might be right. And we actually had some feedback last night in our listening session that someone exactly pointed that out, saying that the presentations that were done at the initial were really well done. And people got a lot of information and context. So it sounded like what we did when the budgets were first presented was a great sort of context for the rest of us. So maybe it is worthwhile making it a little longer, so maybe almost redoing it. Yeah. That for people who aren't able to see it. I mean, did you, could you, you get any sense of what that question? I can tease it out if you'd like. I can, um, I have two options. I can either get a summary or I can look at each of the 180 responses individually. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I can certainly find out for the, the, um, the 41 people that went, how did they respond to question four? I can tease that data out for you if you'd like. Um, if that would be useful. I'm happy to do that. It's not that hard. Yeah. One of the other things I was thinking about and working on the budget intro for our budget book is um, 
know that the analysis that I did of the teacher's contract, because obviously that's a budget driver, and but to recreate that or to even try to <coughs> summarize that as we're introducing the budget obviously isn't possible, but maybe just putting that link back out there because it is archived and folks do have access to it to say, like, if you really want to understand this part of the budget, of the school department's budget, feel free to watch this presentation or review these slides in preparation for the presentations that are coming up, just a way to bring people back to some of that information they have access to. Yeah. Or we can refer, if they do ask the question, refer to them. So after we do our initial presentations, we can kind of, again, using all of these social media and our website, remind people that you still have access to this. If you didn't watch it yet, you can come back to it. It just might be a way to not have to replicate it multiple times, but it's still. Well, it should sit on the budget portal. I mean, we're trying to train people if they want all budget-related information is all available here. Yeah, yeah. And Julie and I just talked the other day about as we were writing this, <coughs> putting that that document as a resource up there, and we haven't really gotten that together. But I think there are going to be a number of things that we're going to say, hey, why don't you take a look at this? This is kind of a weird idea, but what if during the budget forum or during some of the presentations, we could actually show a screenshot of the budget portal and how to navigate it? You know, take a point, a laser pointer, and go for a two-minute walk through what you can where the tabs are and what you click on and what you find. Because the, the flip side to that is you don't want to overwhelm with all of these different places that they have to go to, to find things, but you also don't want to redo it over and over and over again in the hopes that you've hit somebody new a different the third or fourth time that it's been done. So there has to be a, a, a balance of you've presented this twice or three times, you've had your chance to, to follow along, we're still, this process is still moving, but giving them just enough information that they're not like, oh my god, I have you know, five different presentations to watch that we've also got the feedback that people like something that looks like this. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. USA Today graphics. <laughs> right. You got you guys all of you have been in the past forms, right? You guys have any Sage advice for us? I like the idea of trying to drive more interaction than just fill out a card, have it walked up to the stage, get an answer that you can't um, dig down any further on. It's just like, that's it, it's over. One of the best things I found from, from the, um, the, those meetings is some of the write-ups after the fact with questions real data, uh, bar charts, pie charts, uh, numbers. Uh, I find those really valuable to look through every time. That kind of goes to what Joey's saying, too, about that balance between if you're in a one-hour, two-hour, three-hour meeting with people, how much of that depth can you go into when there's another topic to cover and another topic to cover? So I think the follow-up is critical. And the fact that we do say, we're going to go and dig this out and give it to you and put it in a bar chart and post it. I find the Q&A sheets really interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, that, and it's interesting that you say that because we're all sort of focusing on how do we <coughs> communicate for people to get there or to be aware of it or um, build awareness of it. But maybe just after. as much focus needs to be on after it's done, Here's there's the still meeting. all that um, publicity on driving people to the budget the the portal to say is available. Yeah. We know that you may not have been able to get there, or we know that there's a lot of information with a lot of numbers, and it gets tricky to try to write it all down while you're there at the meeting. Go to the budget portal, and every question that was asked, and every there's answer, more detail. it's yeah. right there. Yeah, my question was, okay, who's the audience for this budget form? I mean, <laughs> no, well, I mean, it's, it's for the person that's, you know, I didn't know who was there. You know, is it their first exposure to the budget? In which case, I think you need to keep it up here. Mm -hmm. You know, really high. I don't know. Well, it goes to that. But I, I think, as you were mentioned, the, the Q and A that works good. I think. Oh, I don't know who to give credit. Someone was it Tom? <laughs> <laughs> I, I saw the facial expression. I thought it was you that time. But that that was good for me certainly because it did get the questions answered afterwards. But. Yeah, what
what do you do with the budget? It's like, okay, is this the first time the person has come in? They haven't seen or heard anything. They've never been to one before. And if you start trying to get down into to the teacher contract one, I mean, that took, what, an hour, hour and a half presentation? Yeah. Right. You know, if you try to get into that, they're going to glaze their eyes over and say, this is something Steve and I had talked about a while ago, was just knowing what, what information matters to each individual is, is pretty impossible to do. And so I like the idea that, you know, as a newcomer to this community, that people have a chance to ask really specific questions and to have really specific answers. I think that that's really something unique. I don't know a lot of communities that do that to the level and to the depth that Scarborough does. Um, and so, to what Jody was saying, it might be that we're not going to get a bunch of people to come to the budget forum, but we can still get that information in other ways. Can we track how many people actually go to the budget portal, or, the portal. Or, sure. at, or to that section about the budget forum? Yeah. So, do you guys like the idea of the, trying the, the table discussions? Do you think that's worthwhile or not? I, I, I sort of would like to hear the answer to all the questions. So to the extent that you've broken it up into three or four different groups, um, I'd, I'd be interested in all the answers. So I, How do you divide yourself up? Yeah, <coughs> I'm not sure that I... Could your desire yeah. to be hearing all of the answers be satisfied after the fact through the document that's posted? I suppose, but, but I think it's more... I mean, the, the, the way it's structured now where the entire leadership is basically available, the town and school leadership. Um, if you have a question, you know, you're going to have access to the person who knows the most. Whereas if you're at a table, you know, one of six tables, the person that, that may have the answer to that question isn't at your table. So I, I, to me there's something to be said for keeping it the way it is as opposed to breaking it up. But, yeah, keep in mind that I, I would the original intent of the forum was that, uh, and I think a legitimate complaint about process is that many times folks would take the podium and ask a question and the constraints of our process or what have you or the right personnel weren't there to answer it, so they would leave without an answer. And so we wanted to provide an opportunity for someone to ask a question and to leave with an answer. Mm -hmm. Or at least uh, the beginning of an answer. Right. And not have it dominated by talking heads, like long, detailed presentations. It was really an opportunity for questions and answers. And we're certainly, I don't know how we're going to be able to serve someone who's interested in you know, details of right. this or that, as opposed to Larry's comment of someone brand new to the system really needs a 30,000 square foot, or foot view of it. And we can't serve them both equally well. And it's hard for me to give you feedback because I'm not part of that group. I might, I kind of wander into these things quite frequently. And so to, to go to the budget hearing, it's like, I didn't go last year because it's like, okay, what are they going to tell me that I haven't you heard from, already to get out. from all of you folks? And I, and I think we don't want to get too far away from 56% of... Like the format. So, yeah. 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 56% of those that attended said, do nothing at all. Right. Right. So are we creating more work in, to Steve's point, it may not be solving the issue. I think, I, for me, the biggest issue is question number two, or whatever, why did you not attend and you didn't know about it. To me, that needs to be our focus. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Okay. So try to stick with the format that we have. Stick with the format that we have, and maybe we can somehow, you know, not jump from all over the place to, you know, the same question at the beginning, and then there's, like, follow-up. 45 minutes later or whatever, maybe we can sort of wrangle them all together from the ones we get ahead of time, and then maybe the last half hour is from the floor, from the floor yeah. asking questions and us <coughs> answering them. Well, Julie, I, I, like I say, I didn't go last year, but I've gone in the past, and for me, I think it's the best it can be. You know, you, you've got the questions ahead of time, and then the ones you don't get to answer or at that time, you come back and you printed them up or, you know, right. they're available to us. It's like... You know, what else can you do unless you want to make a day long? Right, come in whenever we're here. You know, which is, nobody wants to do that. <laughs> well, and people don't necessarily come to that either. Right, and school officials and town officials and board officials 
everyone's available. They've always made themselves available to answer questions. So I think you know, if you don't get an answer there, there's any number of avenues. But certainly, uh, you know, directing them to the portal. portal is least, okay, here's a place to start. Here's a place to go and look. Are we already collecting questions? We've got, we've got to put that off our own. Oh. The budget hasn't been presented. Right. It would be kind of strange to ask question. <laughs> well, some Where? people might just have a general. <laughs> when, are, when are dates that are, <laughs> things are going to happen? I, mean, I think we decided it was going to be the very next day. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. After the first one thing, if we do choose to take questions on the floor, just from an efficiency and a practicality point of view, I, uh, you know, there are multiple opportunities, whether it's before the Board of Ed or the Council, at public hearing and to offer public comment. And I just want to be careful that we use that time wisely. We've assembled the, the folks to answer the questions. Let's focus on questions rather than a comment or a we <coughs> building up to a question, and all of a sudden we get. I'm a little concerned when you hand the mic to someone. Right. Uh, just keeping it efficient and on point is, you just lose that control. And I think uh, that was always a concern. Right. And so I think the three minute, you have three minutes to speak is, is fine, but it's different in that we now can answer. But this is not a public hearing. It's just a it question. Is, it's, it's, that was not the attempt, right. I didn't think. It's a question session, so. Three minutes doesn't it, it, that, does it? Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying people will use it, but it's only human nature that it takes you some people longer to get to the question than others. And time is precious when you've got a board assembled. Is there a moderator? Yeah. There is. Yeah, he would. So that, yeah, that can really count. In the past, how it happens, have but people even write down their question and give it to Kevin, and he then asks it. So there are questions from the floor. They're just not coming right, directly from the person. From the but person. to satisfy no. Tom's, because that really is very real, no matter what sort of question and answer session yeah. you have, yeah. that, so if the moderator is aware of that ahead of time, could they help to moderate the effects of yeah. statement making okay. and get people to focus on questions? Well, and that's, yeah. at Community Dialogue, too, they, read, they write their question and then they read their question. There's no other comment. comments about it. But I don't know if that strategy works yeah. the same, if that changes. I don't recall anybody really getting up and going off the deep end if either one of the last two, like, no, because you know. because we didn't have it. 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 One year, he was, there were two no. microphones in the audience. Yeah, yeah that's not yeah. the, the, the first year that we did it. I could nobody just, really got it. Yeah, and nobody really yeah. asked. Okay. So we'll last year, it was just. I mean, the way that. Probably the charge on that is just reserve the final 20 minutes or half an hour yeah. for that. And so, yeah. right. you know, however it plays out, it plays out, just so there's yeah. bound, uh, boundaries around it. Right. Did we collect feedback that evening from people who attended last year? Yeah, yeah. No, no. Yeah, on the way out the door, like some type of. Yeah, just yeah. like a quick exit slip. Yeah. Or as we give them the postcard for them to write their questions. We give them the second sheet that says, please write this before you leave and drop it in the box or whatever, so they have it right with them at the time. Because when they're ready to leave, they're going to be ready to leave. They're not going to want to stop and fill it. We could also have a, for those people that don't want to fill out the slips, we could have um, for them to, on their phone or whatever, a quick link for them to click and they can mm -hmm. give us feedback through a Google form or something like that, too, oh, so that cool. the yeah, data is just good. there with the push of a button. Yeah. Already compiled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the key part, right? Already compiled. Like at the community dialogue, every table was given a Chromebook, and it had a Google form set up for it. And you know, it was just a, it was a great way to compile the data. That we right. The the only reason why we didn't do that with the feedback form was because we there was only one computer per table, and but most people have them, so we could share them. But and we wanted to make sure that. We got as much feedback as possible because sometimes if you're like, just sometime in the next 24 hours, if you could fill this out. Mm -hmm. in addition, mm -hmm. Okay, so I think we've decided that it will stay the same format. Um, there is a change in that it's at Wentworth and the auditorium. Yeah, and I think that's important when we're communicating to remind people that it is a different venue. Just from a strategic perspective on the, on the setup of the room. Um, we can still have tables and chairs around, and then that sort of opens up the possibility for a more flexible 
feeling, or we can just go with straight rows of chairs. And it's just, I mean, that's something we don't have to decide today because we don't have to set the room today, but it's something to keep in mind about how the so, structure of the okay. room is going to inform the process for us and what we need to tell the maintenance guys. I like the chair. Kate, I'm not the looking into just the logistics of that room. Audiovisual, I think, is there any. Um, Thing we need, I we have need to, to do talk that. with Kelly about it. I'm, I think we have what we need, right? Or well, we what we did was it's not a live stream from there. Oh, right. It's um, live. It can be live from the high school. Right. So what what happened with community dialogue was they gathered the footage and then they they edited it a little because there were some parts where it wasn't like conducive. It was, it was a different format, right? So you didn't want to watch the whole three hours of community dialogue. So it, I think it ended up being like an hour and 20 minutes or something like that. But that's, I, I watched it <laughs> on the I local channel. <laughs> um, well, do something else. Um, but, so I think that that's how we would have to share it. it so you so can't live stream from that location? No, I don't believe they can. Did they well, live stream could. the? I think you can from cafeteria. We couldn't from the learning conference. But th those are just details we need to check into. Okay. Yeah, maybe it was just a choice to not live stream community dialogue. Because the other piece of that is that last year, Sean and Jody, I think you collaborated on a high level presentation at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Was that the this year again? For the Two finance chairs. Okay. I can handle that. Okay. I'll run it by you and make sure it's halfway accurate. At least on my part. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of input from the crowd. Um, anything else on the budget forum? That's good. Just the, the leader article, maybe sharing the results of this, <coughs> of this survey, and then mm -hmm. saying what our decisions are. That could be like in the next couple of weeks to That's get great. people marking it on their calendar. Do that in our newsletter too. Peter, I think you said that was a, some input you heard last night that on <coughs> surveys, let's make a point of reporting out the results of our survey. Not just that we're doing it, but, data, but what does it mean and what are we doing with it? Yeah, I shared a little earlier with you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what, I mean we, like what Tom's referencing is there's a new town council communication committee. And we just invited people in and just said it's an open forum. Tell us what's on your mind, what's working, what's not working. And what we did here, they used specifically a reference. We did a fireworks survey earlier in the summer, months ago. And they said, that's great. We love surveys. We like responding to them. But what we did, we didn't respond quickly to it. And what they said, what we really want to do is we take a survey, share the information back with us so we can understand how, how it shakes out or our views are. So I think Tom's spot on. So the suggestion to share these survey results then you know, kind of closes that loop. And that's what we talked about, just close the loop with us. You know, if we participated, took the time to do something, give us the information back. So I think that's a great suggestion to share that. Do I have your permission to shut the survey down, close it? Yeah. Okay. And, and Mr. Freeman is going to be able to moderate the view. I've not spoken with him, but I, I just certainly reach out. Someone asked that, and I, I got it in my head, and then I thought, well, I don't really know that. <laughs> 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 He's never said no, so subject to his availability that night, I suspect he'll be willing to do it. Yes, yep, yep, that'd be great. Yeah, that's Okay, so moving on to new business. Um, does anyone have any changes to the order with which we cover these? Or are we good just going down the list? All right, I hear nothing, so we're going down the list. Um, anticipated budget drivers. Who wants to start that discussion? Uh, Kate, do you want to? No, I'm pleased to. Yeah. I'm pleased to. Um, well, I do have a couple of things with me, and I can pass those around. I think that the, the thing that we focused on the last time that we met, and the thing that we'll probably be focusing on for the next couple of months, is the revenue picture. Um, because there's, you know, the, the drivers that we'll talk about on the expenditure side are pretty ordinary and not unusual. Um, and unfortunately, the revenue picture is kind of ordinary and then not unusual either, but it's, it's what's going to be a, a big part of the conversation. So I can't remember whether I shared this with you guys the last time. 
do you have the revenue projection? Um, yeah, actually, you can pass the clump, and then anybody who did get one, please help yourselves. Um, the revenue projection for GPA out of the state is not terrific. Um, we have a situation where not only do we have some significant changes in the governor's proposal to the way that the education funding formula is going to work, but we also have the continuing story of Scarborough being a prosperous community in comparison with others. Um, and the way that the formula shakes out, Scarborough has continued to lose state support for education because other districts have needed that support more than we do, according to the, the story that's told. Um, I also have a document with me that I thought I would share if I haven't already, and forgive me because I'm so brain dead right now that I don't know what I'm sharing what I haven't. This is about minimum receivership. Um, I'm seeing lots of, I don't have this, so let's start it down and pass it around. You said you gave us that one. Did I? No, you see? Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> you can have the job and then pass it around. If anybody doesn't have it, please help yourself. Um, really, my, my point in, in handing that to you folks is for you to have um, an understanding and sort of talking points when you go out into the community and you're talking with constituents and trying to describe what's going on in Scarborough in terms of revenues for education. Um, I think it's a we, we throw a lot around a lot of jargon and we talk about a lot of um, situations that we get into that may not be obvious or, or clearly understood by the public. I have an example of that right here where, um, not to go off on a tangent, but there was an article in the Portland Press Herald about our GPA loss and they quoted Julie pretty extensively, this was like two weeks ago. Um, and, and misquoted, misquoted um, or, or misunderstood, uh, let's say, not, not misquoted. They said that our GPA dropped by $710,000 because we were, because system administration was no longer going to be counted as part of the formula. Um, well, that's not really true. Our system administration cost that's no longer part of the formula was seven hundred and ten thousand dollars, but we don't get seven hundred and ten thousand dollars. That made up a, a portion of our total allocation, and as you all have heard me say a few dozen times, we're getting seven or eight cents on the dollar in our subsidy. So it's more like fifty thousand uh, dollars change in our subsidy is directly attributable to that loss of system administration, not that, that we would get seven or ten thousand dollars back if the state put that back into the formula. <coughs> this kind of stuff, it, it, I think it's it's so complex and it's really hard for people to understand. So even a reporter who's sitting down writing an article on this topic and, and is listening carefully and trying to understand what it is that's going on is just going to miss the boat. Well, because she was so, looking at the E279, which, which is the, a document. the document that describes how funds are allocated by the state through Department of Ed to each district. And, you know, it's, it's a huge sort of science that takes years to understand. And, and even though those of us who have studied how the formula works for years still don't quite know what they're doing. So I, I guess my point in rambling on about this is just that there, there's a lot of um, complexity to the, to the school funding formula. There's a lot of complexity to how Scarborough gets their money or doesn't get it. And I think we want to be as informed as we can when somebody asks us questions like this. I wouldn't want someone in the public to say, oh, well, if the LePage proposal is not accepted and the legislature says, oh, no, we're putting system administration back, that Scarborough is going to get $710,000 more in subsidy. That's not accurate. Right. So, you know, again, I think we all need to sort of be aware of how that works. And, um, and unfortunately, the big story in Scarborough is the valuation piece. And uh, Larissa and I were looking at some numbers this morning, actually. The, the other piece that's a little peculiar about um, state funding is that they're always looking retroactively and making assumptions about what a communities, um, what, their, what their fiscal picture is like based on um, the ED279 that Julie references for fiscal year 18 looks at 
14, 15, and 16 data that we've provided to the state about um, growth in Scarborough. So it's main revenue services who we're, we're taking a look at. It's the full state evaluation put together by main revenue services. Right. So, if they're, so they're looking at historic data. Meanwhile, our formula for figuring out what we think our valuation is going to look like next year is quite different. Larissa was explaining that we're using a, a 10 year span and we're doing predictions. So the state is looking at us in, in, through very rose colored glasses in comparison with other districts. And meanwhile, we're seeing a slightly different picture here at the local level. And to kind of, so what that results in is the state has us in those averages, they think that we're going to be gaining. Um, over a hundred thousand, a hundred million dollars in valuation next year, and that's what they're basing our state subsidy on. And we have us as a, as a realistic <coughs> estimate of fifty-one million dollar gain. So the state is is crediting us with twice as much growth mm. as our very most optimistic number provides, and that's what they're using in their formula to come up with how much money the community needs. That's to Scarborough can afford right. to to pay. So and that's there's a that disconnect, and it's it's you know, like everything else dealing with the state is kind of challenging. Um, so that that's kind of the I don't know, all of the little bullet points that pop into my head right now around revenues. If there is any any specific questions about where we're at, um, obviously none of this stuff is done or anywhere near done. Um, I guess one other thing I would mention in connection with this is that I don't know if you recall a couple of years ago we had a similar situation where the legislature hadn't finalized their numbers and they hadn't passed their budget and so there was a change in GPA really late in the game. Um, so the state uh, DOE and some of the attorneys have provided us with some language that if we come down to the point in our budget process, our budget adoption process in the town of Scarborough, and we don't really know whether we're going to be getting more subsidy, but we might. Uh, we can put language into our warrant articles when we adopt our budget to say what we intend to do with that money. Um, so that's something we can talk about a little further down the road when we see how things are moving in Augusta. But if you think of it this way, that the Scarborough um, School's budget, the expenditure budget, will be passed, and we will have the authority to spend X amount of dollars, and we're assuming that we're going to get revenue of $2 million from the state, and then suddenly through the magic of uh, fairy dust, we get an extra $500,000. We still don't have the authority to spend any more than what we said we did, so we have to figure out where that fits in our revenue picture. Um, and does that go as unexpected revenue? Does it go into fund balance? Do we say that we are, you know, if we have time, do we readjust our tax rate based on that additional income? So it's something that we'll be we'll be thinking about more down the road about how we want to how we want to present that as part of our budget adoption process. So I have a question: um, Have we ever calculated what is our current uh, what would be minimum? receivership for us from a dollar basis. So based upon the projections, how far are we at the $2.2 million that we're receiving? That is how where they're... That is minimum. Okay. Yeah, in fact, if you went through the ED-279 and you came up with the amount that we were entitled to under the formula that they use for everybody else in, in EPS, we would come out with less than the $2.1 million. The reason that we get the 2.1 is 2.15. The reason that we get that figure from them is because they can't give us, under existing statute, mm -hmm. less than, um, right now they're saying 35%, it's 33% or 35% of our um, special education costs. So that's actually what that number represents. Okay. That is a minimum receiver number. So as I keep saying, that's the good news, is that if we're at minimum receiver today, there's no surprises next year. Uh, well, you know, well, it's, well, yeah, surprises. Well, yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Well, the only way that would go up would be if our special education costs go up, because it's a percentage from that. Right. Or and, more money gets put into the formula. But well, we're, but what we're receiving, what they're allocating to us is, is lower than that 33%. Right. <laughs> so we would first have to catch up to that 33% before we would start to see the But if their valuation for those following three years ends up being less than the hundred million or whatever 
that could generate more revenue also? I don't think so, because what, I, I, what I'm hearing is that the valuation for the town is now taken out of the equation for us. We're simply basing it on special oh, education sorry. costs. So the valuation is no longer an issue. I think the only way that you would see the valuation come back into play in Scarborough would be if ours were to significantly drop in comparison with other districts. Because they will look at that every year. But again, they're working on historic data, so they'd be, you know, next year they're going to be looking at 15, 16, and 17. Um, there's always going to be a lag there. And the, the chances that, I guess I should knock on something, but the chances that Scarborough is going to suddenly be in a, in a declining situation as compared with the rest of the state um, is it's pretty un unlikely right now. So the last time we talked to you, it seems like there's a fairly high confidence that the 1.4 is probably what we're going to know, that any changes from the state probably won't be known until after our... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Kind of that's, well, that's that, my, nothing's changed in that court, right? Nothing's so really changed there. No, I mean, that's my fear. I, I suppose it's conceivable that the legislature could really, you know, turn up fire and decide that they're going to put more money and allocate more money to education, which, yeah. again, as Joe said, is really the only way that we're going to see a significant increase. Um, but I, I really think that we have to sort of guess that this is what it this is, is, what it is and, and on it. Yeah. plan on it. And then if we were to receive more than that, then that would be lovely. And we've got some options we'll give you that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I don't think it, even if, if the EPS changes, if the changes in the formula are not accepted by the legislature which that I do think is pretty likely because those are, are, are kind of drastic and sort of out of the scope of the budget process, really, if you think about how these things should be handled. Um, I'm afraid that that doesn't really help Scarborough that much because of the valuation piece. That, you know, making the, the value of the allocation higher doesn't change the ability to pay piece that they believe we've got. And when I went up to it, it uh, to the budget hearing to testify on behalf of the Scarborough Public Schools, you know, the, the picture that I was trying to paint is that although our land valuation is going up, our median household income is not. And so the, the, the way the formula is calculated is already inequitable or imbalanced in the way that they're saying, we are, in the way they're calculating a community's ability to pay. Right. And right. so, um, you know, not that I think my three minutes of testimony is going to change um, a whole lot with that, but that is something that we really recognize in preparation of this budget, is that not only are we feeling pressures as a school department, because the work we have to do is, is changing rapidly, um, but our funding isn't necessarily matching that, but we also recognize the squeeze that's on our, on our taxpayers, too. And so and we're trying to, you know, our goal in developing this budget was to develop the most fiscally responsible, credible budget that we could that allows us to continue to grow and improve at the rate we need to in order to meet the mandates that are before us and also to meet the needs of the students that are before us, but also realizing that, you know, there's a limit to the capacity to, to fund. I think from a planning perspective, though, I really kind of, you know, five of us, including Chris, have all been at this table for the last three years altogether. It hasn't really changed except for maybe, I think Donna, except for staff. So I think that this is a good point. I hope that it drives policy conversation about how we plan going forward because we should stay at this position of planning from a minimal receivership and hope for a better outcome and then have a policy that dictates how do we then use the funding going forward. Um, that way we know where we are and we're controlling that conversation because I hope we never go back to the situation of, you know, let's cross our fingers, toes, and everything else waiting for the state to come in, which is sometimes after the referendum question. Yeah. Well, and it does allow us to back. be planful and, like you said, in some sense to control our own destiny and not wait around right. um, for outside sources. And I, I honestly think it's, I'm, I'm sure it's maybe too pessimistic because I was bragging about being optimistic earlier, but... Uh, the, unless there's some willingness on the part of the state to put more money into the pot, which means that there has to be some other way to raise that money, um, and in the, there, there's no way that that's <coughs> going to be getting significantly more funding because there's not enough for anybody, mm -hmm. much less for all of us to have that 55% that they'd like to have. Yes, it has to be veto-proof. It has to be two-thirds support, I suspect. Mm -hmm. yeah. If the governor... If history suggests anything, the governor is likely to veto something, so it's got to be veto-proof. 
Absolutely. And the and the whole messaging from, from Augusta is in the other direction. You know, let's get rid of income tax, let's get rid of that three percent that we all thought would be a nice idea to fund education. Let's get rid of revenue sharing. Um, it's just, you know, there doesn't seem to be the political will to really raise the money to adequately fund any of this from the state level. Yeah. So that was your well, name. Anything else on the expenditure side? Or is it um, I, have, I have my, my, my basic sort of high level budget drivers and, and I can just keep on going because I know Tom's dying to get in here and pitch his side. Um, teacher salaries, uh, I think as Julie said, I, I think it might actually be valuable for us to put that um, the presentation that we did on the on the teacher contract and the impact and the scope of that and, and, and what the goals were in that. Um, the actual dollar value of the change from one year to the next in the teacher group, um, which incorporates steps, COLA, the new contract, is about $900,000. So just under a million dollars of our budget expenditure change will be in our teacher group. We're talking about 311 people, human beings. Um, it's about 306 point something FTEs. And uh, so that's, you know, obviously that's a big deal. Um, of, the, of the overall budget? From last year to this year, was the problem that you said from last year to this year it's like a 900 to a million. Yeah, I don't have a percentage on that, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I can sort of parse this out into a, into a table so that we can use it a little more effectively. I think that uh, you, you've probably heard this a few million times as well. I mean, I mean Larissa and I were saying the same thing. Our, our budget is all people. The town budget, I think she said, is about 75% percent departments. Sorry? For some departments, not for all. But oh, right, right, because, yeah. Well, we There's some equipment of, going on. We have a there. lot of sand <laughs> and salt. Um, but in our, our side of the budget, we're 76.1% people. And 99% of those people are under a collective bargaining agreement. So that's obviously going to be one of our biggest drivers. We have two bargaining units that are in negotiations right now, the bus drivers and the educational support staff. The bus drivers... Um, we have 19 folks right now. We're hoping to have a full complement of 22, but we keep losing people. Um, those folks are in negotiations as well as the education support staff, which is 124 people. And so that's, you know, that's again, it's a, going to be some kind of a cost driver, um, but because we don't have fixed numbers, what we're doing now is estimating based on the uh, terms of the expired contract and then adding a <coughs> guesstimate of a COLA so that our board can engage in good faith bargaining. And so that, I'm figuring, is somewhere in the $150,000 range change from one year to the next. Um, but that does incorporate the terms of the expiring contract as well. So if we want to parse this out so that we you know, see more detail about the impacts, we can do that. Uh, my next big one is, is Anthem benefits, benefits overall. A um, little bit of question about workers' comp. We're working out some rates with our insurers, um, but uh, we won't know our Anthem rates until next month. They've told us by the end of March they're going to give us the tiers that they're using now so that you have the high risk, low risk, me medium risk, and I think there's maybe, I think there's four of them, but I'm not sure what the middle bands are labeled as. So we'll know the worst case scenario and hope that we're not in it. Um, last year's increase was 8% over the prior year. Um, I'm budgeting at 5.5%, which is an average of the last four years, and helping a lot with my tools crossed. But that's a good, that's a good number. I'll tell you a funny story. I just got my uh, new uh, premium for uh, auto insurance, and it doubled. No really? accidents, good credit. Nothing. I called them up and they said it's because the cost of health care in this market has skyrocketed so my insurance premiums up for auto insurance. Is that because you have like, <laughs> like liability and it's No, I did. That injured? was, I, I actually laughed. Did you? I was like, really? <laughs> did that said, work? They said, no, I didn't get anything out of it. <laughs> I was Just like, you got to be kidding me. It went from 1700 bucks to or 700 bucks to 1400 So really, though, what's the rationale? Okay. Because they're, because if you're in an accident, you might injure someone, and it might cost I more. I couldn't stop laughing, so I <coughs> You don't know the real answer. <laughs> I know. 
Uh, I was going to say I'd become so company for a quote. Any, any others? Hey, um, I have uh, one other biggie. Well, let's say two other biggies. One is um, Maine PERS, our state retirement for teachers. This is another one of those cost shifts from Augusta to the local districts. You remember a couple of years ago they said that we were going to have to start picking up the utter share of the of, um, retirement costs, a share of the retirement costs that were at that time paid by the state. So they started that process by asking local districts to pay 2.65% of all the teacher salaries. And that includes teachers in ed techs, it's the instructional um, folks. So this year, they've increased it twice now. This year, they're uh, going to increase the percentage that the towns need to contribute by another 18%, which sounds really high, but it's 18% of the percentage that we were at, which was 3.36%, so it's going to go to 3.97%. And the effect of that, um, standing alone, the, the increase of that is about $150,000 as well. So we've pretty much doubled the cost of the change from when we first started doing this. So the first year that we did it, um, we went from zero cost to the district to about $550,000 cost to the district, which was not nice. Um, and we absorbed that, and we kept going forward. And then the, you know, the next year, they kept it the same. Then they increased it a little bit more. Um, this next year, I'm anticipating that we're going to be spending about $950,000 on main purse costs. So we you know, close to double that original expenditure, which was already a little bit of a burden. Um, so the change, actually, from this year to next year is really more in the order of $150,000, but it is a driver. My last big driver is um, technology, and in instructional technology, most of you, like Sean said, have been sitting at this table before, so you've heard this story. Um, we have a cyclical tech refresh, which happens every year, one phase per year, K2, um, Wentworth School, Middle School, and High School are considered the four phases. And every four years, one of those um, phases is targeted for an update on their technology. And that's everything from operational stuff, like a desktop for the secretary at the front desk, to the classroom devices, projectors, um, dot cameras, um, and uh, the now the one-to-one -one devices that we have for our students to work with every day. So um, for ever, the Tech Refresh was in our CIP budget. And over the past three years, we have slowly moved portions of that cost into our operating budget, believing that it's fiscally responsible for something that you're going to do every four years, and that every year you're going to have some expenditures to have that under operating rather than having it be bonded, or even a, you know, a short-term lease or what have you. But there's no point in borrowing money when you know that that expense is going to continue at more or less the same level every year. Um, so this is year three of that transition from CIP into operating, and we've added about $100,000. Well, no, we've added exactly $100,000 into the operating budget under the tech uh, equipment line. So that's another driver. Um, the balance of the tech refresh will be in CIP this year, and then we'll hope that after that, everything that we really need to do that isn't long term, will be in operating. And there are some things that will always be long term. You know, if you're buying equipment that's going to last for 15 or 20 years, you don't need to. Um, it, it does still make sense for some things to be in CIP. But the idea is for that transition to continue this year. And we're also looking at, can we um, stretch out those refresh cycles? So that's something that we've been looking really closely at as we transition um, with MLTI in middle school to see if that we can kind of use some of those devices to offset the refresh cycle and stretch it to five or six years at some of these levels. Yeah, and that's an, uh, that's an advantage that we haven't had in the past because we haven't had enough devices to sort of stretch that out across the district. But the more that we've now provided to, to students, we have the um, ADP, which is the insurance plan, the accidental, uh, accidental device protection plan, 
So we're not having a lot of costs in terms of repairs and, and um, replacements in the early phases of the implementation in each phase. So that means that we can stretch things out. We're also collecting fees from the students for the one-to-one -one devices. So um, we're, we're kind of looking at maybe being able to either <coughs> extend the length of the tech refreshes or also offset some of those costs with some of the fees we've been collecting. So I think that's a, a nice trajectory to be on, but it does definitely say it's a change from, you know, now there's an extra $100,000 in our, in our operating budget that we didn't have last year. I just did my just So last time overall, all in, all of these items that sound like unusual items, plus just normal items are in the budget. You said last time you thought you'd be in the range of five to six percent overall. This sounds like it is it migrated to that? No. Yeah. No, still five. No. Even with these items you just Even with these items that I've articulated. Now that isn't to say that I might not get some nasty news from Anthem, but um, the other stuff the negotiations piece, I think we're in pretty decent shape unless something outrageous happens. And, um, yeah, no, that, that will still keep us at the 5% mark. Thank you. So not much excitement on my side. Um, uh, we're looking at uh, maintaining total increases for staff, and we certainly have the honor of contractual obligations. We also have a fire contract up for renegotiation, so we've got some money we need to provide for that, as just as Kate described. Uh, health insurance is going up significantly. We're actually carrying a 15% increase. No. <laughs> well done. Uh, How does that apply? Will that apply <coughs> to the same pool? Mm -hmm. It's a uh, completely different pool. They're in a different trust. Yeah. Okay. Same concept, but different health yeah. trust. That's interesting. They, they were in a bigger pool. Well, keep in mind, our, our trust, very different. Tom's well, trust wouldn't take us, so we're probably grateful right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and there's, it's, it's fairly complicated. I've actually invited Peter to be yeah. to understand, you know, meet with our rep and understand some of the mechanics here. Uh, it, it's no solace to us, but uh, we were informed yesterday we're actually at the lowest rates of anyone in our trust. Oh my gosh. Uh, so much so, almost 40% below the average rate in the trust. So we're, we're doing very well comparatively. Uh, we've had some experience issues and that's why we're seeing some of these gains. But overall, big picture, we're still fairly low uh, comparatively. Uh, workers' comp is seeing a nearly 10% increase. That's really claims driven. So there's a three year running average for your experience modification. So that one bad year we need to shed and I think we'll we're doing quite well in, in the other years, so. It's well, we talk. What was that number? Ten percent workers' comp. Workers, thank you. And then a number of small staff adjustments. Uh, we had two new uh, full-time staff come on this current year with the late start, so we're seeing their full salary next year for the first time. Uh, planning department is proposing a part-time position to deal with uh, the expected development that um, council's been somewhat what involved with. It may be seen whether we can actually fund that ultimately, but I think it's an important discussion to have, so it will be part of my proposal. Uh, the assessor's office, I'm looking to go back to a full-time assessor, so there's additional cost from the shared services model. And I think library is looking to um, expand a part-time position to a full-time position. So none of them are huge. Uh, they're all kind of a little fine-tuning. Uh, again, we're, we're in interested in having a conversation with the Finance Committee to see if any or all of those can survive. Uh, final piece that Ruth and I need to work on is the capital funding. Uh, as has been our practice, we're trying to fund more and more out of appropriations or not long-term finance. And that obviously has an effect um, the more that we do. So that's some of the final fine-tuning we're doing on the budget. On the revenue side, the good news is excise continues to perform strongly. Um, we have another $200,000 we're projecting there. And there's some modest increases in the building permit, um, you know, electrical and plumbing and such, really indicative of the development activity that we're seeing. So all told, we're, we're below 3%, just slightly. Trying to do our part to... And main revenue service was up a little bit too, right? Yeah, 10 or 20,000, something like that. Uh, not, not significantly. 
So we lose a million four in the schools, but we get an extra ten thousand on the main revenue share. You know, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Right off. The other piece, which I, I don't know if it's considered a budget driver, is that uh, for the property tax relief, we did up that a little bit for this coming year because of all of the people that fund the expected need, mm -hmm. which is one of the council's goals. Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, it was a big increase. I mean, participation went up last year, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. We went from seventy-five thousand in the budget this year to one twenty next year. So, how many people lived in here? It was a pretty. Good it's. Community. I love that. Yeah, it's yeah, it's about 500 people. So, yeah. well. Good. well received, for sure. I think that's another one. You know, at some point, just what we learned from that. That's what we heard last night too. That there may be still a ton of seniors that or people that could qualify that aren't aware. Don't realize that they're yeah, not aware. That, that available to them. Yeah. yeah, I think that's huge. It's, really it's one of the big pieces of conversation that we need to have about our folks' ability to pay. Sure. Yeah. And on the school side, we're trying to think creatively about other funding sources as well. Um, we have some some ideas that are already happening, but others that we're trying to generate sorry, to that same effect. We're realizing that some have capacity today and some don't. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else on that item? So moving on to the use of fund balance as budgeted revenue. I'm not sure that we'll get to all of these um, in the next 10 minutes because I know people are going to have to start leaving. This is a rescheduled meeting. We appreciate you all mm -hmm. finding us. Yes, yes, you're one of them. Hint, hint, that's Sorry, you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for keeping me on track. Um, so use of fund balance as budgeted revenue. I think Kate talked about it briefly. Um, that it's something as we continue to work through this process and budgets are formed, we need to figure out um, where we're going to land and, and how we're going to land. And hopefully, it's softer than the state is yeah, I think that's, allowing. I mean, yeah, it'd be great to put that later on in the agenda because I think it's, it, and it's, and I think it was what Sean had touched upon a little bit too. Not only do we need to think about how we land this year, but how does that, how do we Perfect. feather that in? How we land out the next couple of years to kind of level level the impact. So I think there's going to be it's a great conversation. And I think you and I briefly talked about it, talk, saying you know we may not know where we land this year before this budget is, is finalized. So there has to be some sort of planning yeah. um, and find balance of what do we use this year, and then how do we keep the right amount going forward so we continue to have a soft landing, but we don't know at the end of the state budget cycle, will there be more given to us? Um, well, so personally, I think that we should plan that we're going to get cut 1.4 million, the worst mm -hmm. case. And what we plan on is based upon the funds that we have today, what's planned on what our landing is going to look like over three years or four years or whatever that timeline is based upon mm -hmm. statutory requirements for the use of the funds. Um, as far as anything that we get in addition, I personally, I say we plan on expecting nothing, and then if it comes in, we develop a policy that says that those funds will go into a restricted account that will be used in the following year, or some some type of policy wherever it might go. Mm -hmm. um, but we should plan on the worst because we're at that worst position, mm -hmm. and we just plan out the landing based upon the reserve funds that we have already. Just, we knew we were going to be here, and that's why we planned over the last two three years the use of the fund balance, so the use of the Wentworth funds and. That's going to help us land softer. Yeah. So that one, I think, will continue on um, our agendas for the next few meetings, at least. And then long-range facility planning update. A lot of these are, are repeats from our last meeting. So can I ask a question? Yes. So when we have that conversation, can we ask staff to uh, come to the table with recommendations on that strategy and that plan from their perspective, from a managerial accounting and management perspective? Because uh, in essence, you could either use it all in one year or use very little of it and spread it out over time. So where is the balance? I'd like to hear the professionals kind of give a recommendation. Well, there's also statute for the school department as right. to how much you have to keep in reserves versus. Right. So, I mean, there's all those other Yeah, so that's why I'm not knowing those statutes. Well, although there's some flexibility. I suppose right. you'll be seeing a recommendation because we're going to be including it right. in the, the use of 
proposed use of fund balance as part of the proposed budget. But are you talking about the, the fund balance that we currently hold, or are you talking about what Kate was discussing, which is that if in July or late June we find out that there's going to be this extra amount of money, what do the fund balance that we hold? Okay. I mean, there'll be two different conversations. Very different. If we're fortunate enough to have that right. second conversation. Right. Okay. Um, but I think I think Sean's recommendation is great. Let's for now. I think we got to assume that's not going to happen for this cycle. I mean, state statute says what I think like three point two percent, three percent. But yet there's there's some flexibility in that. And I'm not suggesting that we automatically be out of compliance. But you know, if we have a plan on how we're going to use it, at least we have a response. Because even the creditors talk about it as part of our credit rating about our fund balance, overall fund balance, not just schools. So I just want to hear, and that's the current use because we knew this was happening. We should not be surprised. And that's three percent of your that year's budget, or what? Three percent of? Um, I believe it's three percent of the current year's budget. Yeah. But it's, it's not a floor; it's a ceiling. Right. right. And that's yeah. So that right. You can't see that. And you have to, but you have to have a plan to use it. That's the thing. It's whether or not you use it in the current year, or at least have a plan to use it. I think so. but at least that's how I read it. So, if you guys can do the research and come back, I'd like to hear your. long-range facility planning update. Um, Tom, want to go first this time? Yeah, I mean, the town side is essentially done. Lawrence has done some work with our fund, our financial advisors, so we've actually done some uh, takeoffs, if you will, of what what debt will look like going out of time and when we might be able to take on new debt. The one piece we have not folded in is the school piece yet, so I guess we're okay. still kind of waiting for that. Okay, yeah, we have that. Kelly, Kelly Murphy was at our thing last night and shared that maybe you had come to some type of yeah position on that, and so that's yeah, why we, it's kind that of decision was made back in January in terms of the recommendation, and the pricing is just being was being updated. Yeah. But currently, we're deep in the application, the rating application cycle for DOE funds. Um, that application is due April fifteenth, I believe, and we're completing four extensive applications. Uh, for the middle school and each of the primary schools. And uh, the key point in that process is that the you're applying for the needs and the deficits of each existing building. You're not applying for a solution. And then they, the, they being the Department of Ed, comes out and does a site visit, walks around each of the facilities. Um, Todd Jepson and myself went up to Augusta and met specifically with Scott Brown, who's in charge of all of that at the Department of Education, and we had like a two and a half hour meeting with him. He was able to give us some historical perspective in terms of, you know, what types of projects make the list and what projects don't and where Scarborough has fallen on the list, has fallen on the list rather. And so I'm being really optimistic, but it's still, it's an 18 month application process from the time that we submit it, because they do go out to every single school district that applies and visit every site. Um, and so we'll see where we are. So that you have, uh, I guess I didn't appreciate that you had it done, I, because there were still some decisions to be made as to which projects, which direction you went. Yeah, those, have those decisions been made? Yes. Yeah, those decisions were made back in January, so maybe it's just making sure you have the most current numbers. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I beg your pardon, we were, we were waiting on that. So then is there a way to take both of those plans and then consolidate them into a timeline of, of needs? Mm -hmm. yes. um, yeah, I think that actually that would be a great inform, uh, informational piece for everyone because I went, I gave a state of the community kind of speech <coughs> to once there's a school board member. And there was kind of a lively debate about one of the solutions, um, and there was no talk about what the actual decision had been. So, but again, know. we don't come up with a solution. Right. Our application. Uh, excuse we, me. What the recommendation is as far as where you are today. So there's there's, there's no two comment. parts to it because yeah. we have to basically give a recommendation to to the town so right. that it can be folded into the the comprehensive planning document <coughs> plan. But in terms of the work that we're engaged in with the Department of Ed, yeah. they don't really want to know about your recommendations. <laughs> they okay. just want to know about. But, but even if it was local, I, I, I didn't even know. So that's. If we okay. I'd love yeah. to know. Yeah. Did that once. <laughs> so, so it, it, at least from a somewhat planning perspective, the application process you said is a the minimum of eighteen months out. 
We've been so, working on the application since December. Yeah. Um, it's due in April, and then it takes a bit, approximately 18 months for them to generate the list. Um, and so then they make a priority list. Um, and then it just is dependent upon how much funds are available as to how many of those projects will receive funding. Um, so I'm really hopeful that nobody else is going to apply to Scarborough, <laughs> and then we're going to make the top of the list. <laughs> so that, from the so that probably means that based on that time schedule, probably for the next three years plus, there's not not much you'll be doing while you wait to that kind of gets you get queued yeah. up and you find out where you fall. I think once we find out where we are on the list within, fall, in yeah. the 18 months, then we can start to talk about what that means. you know what that means for our community. Uh, the other benefit of us applying and going through this process is that it holds our buildings harmless in their current state so that any improvements that we do, um, so we'll end up with like a rating score, if you will, to oversimplify it, and then any improvements that we make to those facilities, our score never changes from what it currently is, so long as every application cycle we continue to apply. Um, and so I think that in years past, Scarborough had not applied because they just didn't, they didn't think they would make they the were list. So then any improvements yeah. that we made on the buildings, basically you're only held harmless until the next application cycle. So if you don't complete the application again, it doesn't really matter what the state of your schools were at that point. So um, that's important for us because we have some, some immediate facility needs that need attention or that are going to need attention within the next couple of years. So. Um, that's another reason why I was really adamant <coughs> that we complete the application and we do a really thorough job. And that involves a lot of man hours. Uh, it's not just uh, something that someone can sit down in a day and complete. Our <coughs> chairman has been working really closely with us. Mm -hmm. Todd has devoted um, a lot of time to developing that, but then each building principal is also involved, along with all of the district leaders, because you have to have um, sections on you know curriculum and programming. You have to have um, sections on special education needs. and you know, even so much to where I'm writing about our mission, vision, values, and goals. Um, that goes into the application, too, so it's really But the second piece of that, so while they're sort of in application, are you anticipating some large capital improvements to the buildings? Well, I think we have five boilers that are 22 years old. Yeah. I'm getting those numbers but right. Iron. That might be six boilers that are 23 years old or 21 yeah. years old, yeah. but so um, that's pretty much the life of a boiler. So we're <coughs> we're crossing our we're fingers. We're wondering what's going to yeah. happen with that, and then um, some roofing maintenance and things like that that's going to to be happening and. Um, some other adjustments that have to be made in order for us to meet programmatic needs. So a boiler is like a hundred thousand pop per day. I don't know the number. <laughs> I'm not going to put it on. I don't remember. In a while, but. Thank you. Legislative update. Is that? Let's say you are legislative update I guru. I know. I did. <laughs> um, I think that Julie would actually be the best one to speak for. Me. Fred going up to, to testify. Um, the legislature, there was nothing, we had a meeting yesterday yeah. with the MMA. There were no bills that um, were directly related to our financial position. That, that was not, um, I was, but you know, if anything changes by next month, but we should be in theory winding down as far as proposed legislation, and now okay. it's just a question of to seeing what passes and how it falls out. But I think I have nothing to report for this. Did anyone really take a position that they, because I didn't get to attend, but on the, uh, the whole fund balance thing for the school program. Mm -hmm. Not that we discussed yesterday. Did they support it? I do not know. Okay. You don't talk about it. There's a proposal uh, regarding the fund balance and how to plan, and it has to relate to basically being able to keep more in fund balance for mm -hmm. capital improvements, is how I understood the legislation. Yeah, I have not been following that one closely. There's I was surprised. It was the last bit of that. There's several bills that are still on the table for education. Um, that could be a full-time job, <laughs> monitoring a couple of those. Yeah. But uh, I, I don't really have anything new to update since since testifying. There were uh, there was a really strong turnout. There were 70 people on the schedule to speak. Luckily, on number 13. <laughs> so I I was able to testify at <coughs> around 2:30, I think, um, at number 13. So I think they were they were pretty late in the evening, but. Um, Lots of passionate testimony just about how the, the 
proposes to change the funding formula through the budget process really is inappropriate, but also a misunderstanding of what system administration is. Um, but what I learned from a, a follow-up trip up to Augusta was that uh, it's for us it's not even about the changes that are in the formula, it's about the valuation. Sure. So even even if that didn't occur through this biennial budget, I think that you're still going to be in a very similar position as the way I and yesterday's hearings were about revenue sharing, as far as what would affect the towns. Um, and so we're just waiting to see how those, they, that was the public hearing was about revenue sharing and the changes to that program. And um, it's never been fully funded anyway. And it's just going to be interesting to see how they choose to move forward. No, it, it has been fully funded at 5%. In the last 20 years, it's been reduced to 2%. So the reason we're not really squawking is 2% 2, 2 of what we have in current year. We're not losing any more. I think the the conversation now is returning back to 5%. I thought. That's what they're trying to propose. It's returning to the 5%. Whether the station depends, I thought. I don't think it's going to happen. It's staggered over time. Yeah. With the, I think that the first step being more like 3. Yeah. We're not counting on extra revenue. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so takeaways and to do's. Uh, I think. First and foremost, Peter and I and Kate and Carrie, um, the two chairs of the communications committees, will get together um, sooner than later and and really hash out sort of a marketing plan for the budget form. If we could make those flyers and include the town council meeting and then the, the school board, like April 5th, April 6th, and the budget form, like all in one flyer okay. and put it out there so people yeah. can follow the conversation. I will confirm with Kevin Freeman that he was available that evening. Right. And also the kind of the logistics of audiovisual live streaming, those kinds of details. I, I've got on my list um, to make up a slide for the budget form to be putting onto the cable channel. Um, to publish the survey results in the town's newsletter as well as post them up on the Facebook page. And Carrie will tag that into the school's Facebook page when we're back to the town. Okay. Um, and then I guess I will wait I, maybe to hear from you after you guys have met at the communication committees um, regarding how you want to promote on town um, okay. library, school, Facebook pages, and so forth from there. But I'm at your service. Congratulations. Okay. And then, was there one part of this survey that you were going to tease out for us? I can if you'd like to. I can tease out of the 41 respondents that had gone before. We can find out how those 41 people responded to the question four. So I can get that for you as well. I think, I think it, was, it was specifically around what they wanted more. Yep. How do they want to, were they the ones that said we want to see more questions from the floor, or were they the ones that, let's find out where they, where they were on that. Yeah, where they were Perfect. Just two questions about printed news. Um, there was a conversation about reaching out to the Portland Press Herald just to try to get a story about printed <coughs> messaging. Whose voice do we want that to be? Do we want it to be Tom and I? Do we want that to be the communications subcommittees doing that reach out? I would say the superintendent and town manager, but I, I don't agree. know. I agree. That'd be great. Thank you. I'll try to make that connection and see what we can do. Yeah. And then, are you contacting Mike about getting an article in the leader with the survey? Carrie will be. Carrie will be. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so. Because we already had that on our list um, to reach out to him for a couple of things. So. Public input? Anyone from the audience? Larry, Mr. Hartwell? Uh, on transparency, I think you really all worked very hard the last year, at least a year, on improving that. It's, you're continuing with that in this discussion today. Um, you've also heard me say, I think something as far as transparency to the general public is, again, the top line. How much is the school budget increasing from last year, not just the middle rate? And as we see today, uh, the, the town is coming forward as they have last year, the year before, 3% or less. The school budget is 5% or above. Um, and the school budget represents, of course, two-thirds of, the, uh, of the, uh, the total expense for the, the town. I've got, I've got some graphs here from Larissa and Julie and Steve, so pretty good sources of information. Hmm. Um, 
And the, the first three, I think, are the most important. Uh, and this is taking 2012 through 2016, and the inflation compounded has been 7% for that period of time. Social Security, we know it's been less. That's added up to 5.3%. Our tax rate has gone up 22.2%. The driver of that has to be, obviously, the school department. Um, and we talk about inflation being very, very low, and yet year in and year out, on the school side, we're always way above that. Now, I know you folks made a uh, unanimous decision last year to increase the, the, uh, the salaries on the school side to, to be competitive with four or five in, in the area here. Um, going for 2016, uh, we increased, our projections were we increased about a million and a half dollars, and then next year it will go up another million and a million on top of that. I don't have a problem. You guys make a decision on how you want to spend the money, but I can't, you know, th there is consequences, and it, the consequences is are that, you know, it drives the percentage of increase each year and keeps us from never getting down to 4% or less on the school side. So, and I understand we've got, you know, that's just the top line, and that's one thing, and certainly the revenue side is important. It's difficult. It's always moving pieces. And as I mentioned here, we always run into the problem with the state. We don't know what they're going to give us till after we're voting and so forth. But um, so that's a concern. We've, we've talked about, uh, or you folks have, have mentioned, what the the median income in the, in the in the town from 2010 to 2015 has actually either level or gone down just a bit. Uh, and that's about it. But, you know, I just want to keep that in mind and out, out front. But it, I think uh, I'm very appreciative of everyone's work when I go to these meetings. When I was at the, the workshop last week there, uh, hours spent just in, in those workshops, let alone everything that's done beforehand. And my hat's off to everyone at this table here. We appreciate you coming. So, and uh, I, I like the dialogue, and I want to be able to have a dialogue and not monologues. And certainly you folks do that, and I don't want to be here throwing rocks. I want to speak, I want to be heard, and I want certainly, you know, real feedback from you. I don't know if I can get a chance to talk to you about the, um, afterwards, about the, um, the, um, what did you just mention on the, um, the funding for schools? That's true. Can I just touch base? Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody.